Good evening. I'm James Connell. Welcome to Raven Audio's Concert in Your Living Room series, brought to you by Part-Time Audiophile. Tonight is our inaugural program, and you are really in for a treat because I've asked my good friend and fellow audiophile, renowned violinist Gary Levinson and pianist Baya Cockaberry to perform a few selections from their album, The Complete Beethoven Violin and Piano Sonatas. I would also like to thank the Shigeru Kawai Concert Hall in Plano, Texas for the use of this hall. Now, there are a couple of aspects of tonight's program that a true audiophile will most likely find very interesting. First, Gary is performing on a Stradivarius violin made in 1727, worth many millions of dollars. Secondly, Raven Audio has brought our A-game on the audio production side of things, using a unique mixture of old and new technology to capture the sound of this performance in the best possible way, so that it will be the next best thing to being here, provided that you have a good playback system, and I hope you do. No earbuds. Uh, Gary and I'll talk more about that after the performance. But I want to tell you a little more about Gary and Baya. Gary Levinson was the youngest violinist to ever be in the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. He won an audition while still a student at Juilliard and is now the senior associate concertmaster of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Over the years, Gary has shared the stage with the most celebrated classical artists of our time. It's Ock Perlman. Andre Watts, Yo-Yo Ma, Martha Argerich, Luciano Pavarotti, Placido Domingo, Sir George Schulte, Zubin Mehta, Leonard Bernstein, the list goes on and on, as well as jazz and pop artists like Diana Krall, Tony Bennett, Linda Ronstadt, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Dave Matthews, Anthony Hopkins, and Chris Botti. Gary has also performed on movie soundtracks like Interview with a Vampire, Aladdin, and the Titanic. Our pianist is Baya Cockaberry, Gary's wife. Baya was destined for a career as a pianist from an early age. She's from Tbilisi, Georgia, and made her debut at 11 years old. She went on to earn her master's and doctorate degrees from the Moscow Conservatory. She's appeared as a soloist with orchestras in Moscow, Georgia, Armenia, Latvia, Italy, China, and the United States. Now, after the performance tonight, Gary and I are going to sit down and talk about a number of other interesting subjects, ranging from stereo systems to Stradivarius violins to how classical music is recorded and a few other interesting tidbits. So without further delay, I would like to introduce fellow audiophile, violinist Gary Levinson, and his extraordinarily talented wife, pianist Baya Cockaberry.
Gary, 
That was fabulous. Thank I you. I so enjoyed it. Now, you and Baya did a CD a few years ago of the entire Beethoven, and I'm going to say this correctly, piano and violin sonatas, not violin and piano sonatas like I said in the opening. That's okay. Beethoven actually wrote it that way. He wrote, it's very interesting, like the Mozart sonatas, he wrote um, different things for di different sonatas, but basically piano or harpsichord with violin accompaniment. Um, and this is an excellent example of where we can't really take by rote what is on the page. We have to look at the context of it. This is not a particularly, it's such a departure for 1798. I can't think of another piece of music, even by Beethoven himself, that was anything like this before 1798. The sonatas that Mozart wrote, as gorgeous as they are, do in fact take the position that they are piano sonatas with violin accompaniment, even though the accompaniment is beautiful and, and the violin gets to sing in many different places. In this sonata, acoustically, there's so many things going on between the two instruments. They're really equal parts. So I always kind of chuckle because people love to look at authenticity as if it was in a vacuum. But in this case, you really have to look at the piece of music we're talking about. You know, and it's interesting because it seems like with the general public, when they see a violinist and a pianist, they assume the violin is the melody instrument and the piano is the accompaniment. But this is constantly going back and forth in what you just performed. Exactly. Well, I think with the way we listen to music today, obviously, is continuously changing. And we have to look at the way the perceptions are very much the late 19th century. And really, you know, they started in the 19th century with the virtuoso of soloists, the violinists, the, the flutists, whatever. Um, so basically, whoever's standing up next to the piano is somehow superseding in terms of musicality and, and, and that's really not the case with this piece of music at all. Now it's true that let's say with the late uh, romantic sonatas like the Brahms, the Franck, completely different uh, profile. Um, there are soloistic elements to those sonatas sure. um, and the violin is treated very differently but we got to keep in mind that there was a lot of music and a lot of stylistic differences between 1798 and say 1898. You and Baya recorded not only what we heard tonight, which is a little small portion of the entire uh, group of sonatas that he wrote for violin and piano, but you, re you recorded all 10 of them. Is it 10? Is that it correct? It is 10 sonatas, yes. And it's very interesting. The first nine, as different as they are in terms of musicality and profile and mood and everything else, they were all written really within the first couple of years from 1798 until 1801 or two. And then that last one, the 10th, was written a full 10 years later. So really it's Early Beethoven and a full middle period Beethoven for the last Now, time. I don't know about you, but I actually, when you and Baya came out with that recording a few years ago and you gave me a copy of it, I went and looked to, to see how many other people had ever recorded it. And I haven't found very many recordings of, of the entire Beethoven piano and violin sonatas. Why, why do you think that is? And is that, am I correct in that? Oh, absolutely. Well, as with any cycle, I mean, if you just look at the 32 Beethoven sonatas for the piano solo, to be able to pull off um, all of those works that certainly the solo piano sonatas encompass an even greater range of musicality and moods, um, it's very difficult to have the consistency of the performance, the musicality, um, really the focus for that much music. This is a four CD set, uh, about three and a half hours worth of music, which took place. Really, we were set to do this over, I believe, 12 days. But fortunately, um, I, I had a, a, a major uh, tooth problem, a dental problem. I had to have a root canal. And so we had to oh, break yeah. it up into, into two five-day uh, periods. But I, it, it's just as well because to, to try to do 10 sonatas in 11 days or something would, would have been It just seems like an athletic event, a mental event, everything rolled into one. Unbelievable that you guys could put that together with the level of playing that you did. And by the way, uh, go to iTunes, go to Amazon. Uh, we'll put the information on the screen. Everything, it, yeah. It's unbelievable. It's really, I mean, we're very proud of it for the simple reason, yes, that consistency, the ability to go from one to another. And we didn't really do them in order. I, I kind of looked at the more romantic pieces all together and then maybe the earlier ones um, on different days. But it is very difficult to go from one to the other with the performance quality because if you think of it, even in, a, in an all Beethoven recital, you really don't play more than three, even, yeah, three sonatas in one sitting, and that's two hours. Um, and then in a studio recording in a concert hall, 
the level of concentration and really the emotional commitments for both players is incredible and it's hard to maintain it. But I think now, we, were, you, we were able to do it. You said something that I think a lot of audiophiles will find interesting. Uh, so when you record without an audience, that's considered a studio environment. Right. But typically with classical music, we don't record in a studio like pop musicians. Um, you, you see movie soundtracks done that way. And of course, of course. you've done a lot of movie soundtracks. Yep. But when you do really... Uh, classically recorded classical music, you record in a concert hall because you need the interaction with the room. Uh, right. How did you guys select the concert hall that you did? Really, it was up to in? our engineer, Adam Aveshouse, who you know. Um, he lives in Pelham, New York, upstate, uh, in Westchester, upstate, uh, let's say about an hour. Uh, the hall is about an hour from New York City, from Manhattan. Um, and um, SUNY Purchase is a university that has two major concert halls, both of them are used all the time for performances. And it's the chamber hall that we recorded in for the simple reason that it is a very true concert hall when it's empty. Now, what people need to remember is the science of acoustics is, it's the ancient Greeks used them. I mean, we're not sure. talking about something that was invented yesterday, but the concert hall was never designed to be performed in empty. So there are very few concert halls that sound great and are useful to the musician when there's nobody there. This is a, a concert hall which I believe has a capacity of about 600 people. So it's a large chamber music hall. And yet, the, the response we were getting at this, uh, on the stage with the piano that we were able to pick out, that's another great thing about that hall, we had the pick of four concert-ready grants. And we ended up using a 1975 New York Steinway, even though they have, um, uh, I believe, a, a, a Bosendorfer, and they had two other Steinways, which, one of which was a Hamburg Steinway, completely different sound profile, action, everything about it was really, really very special. All the instruments were special that they had in there. They have a, something called a piano garage. You actually go into a thing that looks like a, like a garage, and then you play these pianos, and you see what really works for the pianist, Then they wheel that thing out on stage and go. And another thing that was special was Adam's choice of microphones, and we kind of replicated that here tonight, using microphones in some cases that are 80 years old, some microphones that are made in the last 5 or 10 years, and kind of balancing between those to recreate as close to possible what it would sound like if you were there in person. The magic of a great audio engineer is to be able to make the artist forget that they're there. And I think that's one of the great things about that recording where in many ways it's impossible to forget the engineers there because you have mics everywhere. Um, we're doing multiple takes. I hear from them, okay, we got to do this section, so on and so forth. But what I have to tell you is really gratifying and to this moment is one of the most exciting things I've ever done in a recording environment is that there was nothing that we had to adjust for in such a way that it didn't feel like a live concert um, where the mics required us to play a different way. Now, in the case of Adam Abe's house, he's a violinist. He has mm -hmm. his master's degree from Manhattan School of Music, I believe. Yep. He's a really good violinist. Yep. Um, and he Still records, plays, by the way. Records all the best. Itzhak Perlman, Joshua Bell, uh, as well as great pianists like Emmanuel Axe. And major Axe, symphony orchestras. Major symphony orchestras. Yep. I think a lot of people uh, have this concept that a recording engineer is a person that places microphones and presses buttons. But I've been to your s sessions before with Adam, and it seems like to me, uh, you know, that's about the first three or four hours of the week, establishing balances and microphone placement. And then he goes into producer mode, and he is literally sitting with the music and a microphone and a pair of headphones, and he is talking back to you while you're on stage and uh, managing, almost conducting the performance in a mm -hmm. way. Is that, yeah. is that too strong of a... No, no, it's, it's exactly right. But I think before we go there, we should really discuss the definition of an, an engineer and a producer because most people think of producers like they do in Hollywood. Somebody who goes out and raises millions of dollars so you can have you know, Star Wars produced right. and so you can, you can do the marketing for it. Um, the producer in a classical session is really the musician and it's someone who listens to what you're doing and then tries to digest what is your intention as a musician. Is it coming out? Is it working with the rest of the takes? Which is a huge thing. Oftentimes, you know, if you have three or four hundred takes, you have to, for one thing, have the same tempo. Because if you have different tempos of great takes, you can't use them. Sure. So the level of intensity and concentration that he is able to turn on and continue once again, it was two sets of sessions, what, five or six days each, and to be able to walk in 
for nine hours a day. Well, to I do was that. there for one of them, and it was profound. And I almost felt like, uh, and not taking anything away from you and Baya, but it almost seemed like there were three musicians, and it was Absolutely. a three-way collaboration, and he was an equal part. Absolutely. In what you guys were able to do. Yeah, he would probably say all he did was capture our best. Yeah. But I would say we wouldn't be as good as we were if it wasn't for him. Yeah. So it, it, it's I always think of it a little bit the producer and, and the engineer slash producer, which he's in one person. Oftentimes. Most of them, I would say, you have two. One person does the engineering and then the mastering, and then the other person does the production and writes down all the takes and stuff like that. But he does it all himself, and I really love that. Um, I think of the engineer-producer as a baseball manager. He does a strategy. He gets the best out of his entire team, regardless of his, if his best player is having a great day or not. It's the great producer is able to get the best out of their players when they're not having their best day. And I promise you, all of us have those. So in order to have consistency in the recording, you've got to be able to really figure out what are you getting and are you getting really what you want and are you getting what the musicians want and what the composer and, and the score requires. Let's change gears here just for okay. a minute. You play a Stradivarius violin uh -huh. and you know I'm a violinist and so... Uh, I'm we both always, love that violin. <laughs> we both love that violin. I'm always fascinated yeah. with it and, and I've held it and played it and it just... It seems like uh, if you've seen the movie The Red Violin, there's kind of like a, a ghostly, magical thing that happens when you take it in, into your hands and play it. When, when you practice or when you're by yourself, uh, is, do you feel like almost in awe of it at times? At all times. I don't think... It, it's funny, it sounds so almost uh, specious, but I, when I tune, I end up listening to the resonance under the ear, and, and it never gets old. I really hear something new every single time when you just tune before you play your scales and arpeggios. Um, it's just such a special tone, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a tone freak, as you may have noticed. Right. So That's the audio file on you, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you listen to that interaction between the strings and the actual box that is a violin, um, it's, it's an incredible experience. Um, now, it's even more incredible when you play great music, of course. But it starts with this magic of a piece of wood, two pieces of wood that were made almost 300 years ago that are not only usable today, but really have no weaknesses, especially when we play new music, music that Stradivari would have never imagined because he was a small town guy who worked at the workbench, you know, for something like 80 out of his 94 years. So we can play music of our time and it sounds so amazing on this instrument that was made in Cremona almost 300 years ago. You know, and that's the other part of it. There's the sound piece, and we'll talk about that some more. Mm -hmm. But then there's this historical piece. And it, can you imagine some of the people that have actually heard the violin that you play? Beethoven himself could have easily heard it. Mozart, right. that violin was made before this country that's right. was formed. That's right. And that's just almost staggering to think of that. The violin was made, what, three or four years before Beethoven was born. Um, and I always tell students, uh, like high school students, that you know this was an instrument that was already making music long before this country was the United States of America. So it's really quite something. With, with that particular Stradivari, and I know that there that there, what maybe three four hundred. Uh, he made twelve hundred instruments. Something like that. There's yeah. maybe uh, a little under. How many are in playable condition? Well, today? really concert ready condition, about three hundred instruments, and there there are six hundred. Um, that exists in museums and various other places. There are lutes. I mean, he made cases. He, he was an incredible businessman considering he never went to college because they had no colleges. Sure. And he worked at his workbench, you know, for 90% for of his life. So Now, I remember seeing, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, that a, one of his violins sold for $18 million. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a few, well, I guess quite a few years ago, they were always $2, 3000000 million. Now they're they're above $10 million, and in some cases, maybe above 20 now. I don't know. Not just yet, but I think the cellos for sure are over 20. Um, look, I mean, so you have the antique value, and then you have the fact that there's incredible demand for, for a very limited supply. Furthermore, um, what makes it, I think, even more difficult is that for various reasons, great solos, once they acquire one, are going to use them for the preponderance of their career. And these days we live longer and our careers are longer. I mean, certainly the great masters of old, like Milstein, you know, played well into their 80s. But if you even think of an average career, once you acquire a strat of being maybe 35, 40 years, you know, it takes it off the mar market for quite a long time. 
Now, Gary, you've played a lot of violins over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, you've played some modern instruments, other older instruments. When people ask you about the differences that you notice, it seems like a complex question to ask because we're talking about sound and a very, very complex uh, sound propagation device is really what a violin is. Right. And then there's the interaction with the musician himself or herself. Uh, do you feel like when you play a newer instrument, you're able to speak with a lesser uh, voice there, there, than you would with the There are distinct differences. Strat? I wouldn't say lesser. Um, the first thing we have to really agree on is that there is... It's a little bit like with wine. So you have old world wine and you have new world wine. So I think of it as the, the instruments, even we have some of the great um, violin, really string makers alive with us today, as well as bow makers, because the bow is an instrument in and of itself. And it's a whole other discussion. How do you marry a great bow with a great violin? But the string instrument makers today, um, they are very skilled Yet, I don't feel like even if they try to replicate the old sound, that it really happens. Now, a lot of people have ideas as, as to why. The popular theory is, well, you know, you got to play with it for 50, 60, 100 years until it gets to be that tone. That may well be. I don't think we'll ever know it because I'll be dead by then. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, the nuance and the color that the great Cremonese instruments have... Um, they haven't been really replicated, even in Stradivari's time. Somebody like Viom, who uh, made some great instruments, and now, they now go for hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, still not the same tone. So really, the sweet spot for the great school of violin making would be from, say, 1640s until 1800, when, for whatever reason, that magic that they had in both Cremona and Milan, and really in, in Italy, disappeared, never to really come back um, at the same level. So a moment ago, you mentioned uh, bows and the importance of a bow. And I, I have to tell a, a brief story, and then I have a question sure. related to the story. You were nice enough to come by one of our audio shows a couple of years ago and play for our room. And then we took your recording and played it through our Raven audio equipment. You had some bows with you that you played, that you, you tried different bows. And one of the bows uh, you told the group was over $100,000 for the one bow. That is unimaginable that a bow could be that expensive and yet they have bows now over five hundred thousand dollars so it gets worse <laughs> okay so what do you notice with a bow that is that expensive well again it's all about the tone but it's also about the strokes you're able to execute how much effort it takes and what it sounds like so oftentimes something will be effortless but doesn't really make a difference you can't hear it's just muddy Sometimes it sounds great and you can hear a difference, but the amount of work it takes, let's say if the weight is too, it's too heavy or it just takes you too long to get started, is a problem if you're playing a variety of, of pieces. I'm very fortunate to own really three bows that I can use with any kind of music. Um, and not a, not a single one of them is, is actually younger than um, 90 years old. And some of them go in, into the 1840s and 50s. Um, the beauty of that is that they're very versatile, and much like the violin, they work for new music, they work for Baroque music and everything in between, and yet the bow makers themselves obviously hadn't heard anything after their death, and yet this, this is the kind of repertoire that works really well with their works, with now, their bows. Gary, over the course of a month, uh, you have multiple rehearsals, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra and chamber music uh, organizations that you're in. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time really listening to live music. And when I say live music, I mean music that doesn't require a microphone, like a rock and roll band. Right. I mean, the instrument, we're hearing that. There's no, there's no microphone. Right. You hear that for hours every day. You practice on your own violin. You practice with bio a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it a letdown when you go and you sit down in your living room and you listen to a stereo system play music back that's been electronically recorded and played back through a loudspeaker system? It can be. Um, I'm happy to say that we've never had greater variety of reproductive equipment. So the speakers that are, are out there today, though not cheap anymore, um, they can be as close to live um, as we've ever had. Um, I, the way that I think about it is you're always, always as good as your weakest link in your system. So clearly you need to have a great amp because it still has to power what you're That's listening to. Right. And, and you have to have some kind of a source, whether it's a, a vinyl or a CD or even, you know, MP3s. 
Um, and then of course you have to have the, the DAC to be able to push all that stuff through and then you have to have your speakers. So, I mean, if you have, I don't want to say cheap, but if you have substandard um, links within that system, you're really never going to have real sound. That said, if you're careful about building those links, just like if you're careful about building a performance, then you're going to have a very satisfying experience. So, um, and also, I, I, I hasten to add, you have to have great performances, whether it's classical performances, jazz, any kind of medium you enjoy. You know, you don't want to have mediocre performances. And the reason I mention that is oftentimes people go directly to YouTube and they just go on whatever comes up first. And that's what it is. Not necessarily the best thing. Generally not the best thing. Right. <laughs> because oftentimes the way the marketing on... Um, well, on all social media, is you're not going to have the most popular performances have some sort of correlation to their quality. Now, you were an audiophile from way back as far as equipment goes. I mean, the, the word audiophile can expand to other things beyond stereo equipment. I mean, sure. your, your violin, a, a music hall, all those sorts of things. I grew up with a lot of records because my dad had them. Your dad uh, is a bassist. My dad world is a former... Bassist. former principal bass of the New York Philharmonic, and he also released a number of recordings with my mom, who's a concert pianist, um, solo recordings. So and my my dad always had recordings because he was busy recording them, and also he was busy collecting them when I was a really small child. And then for a number of years, you were uh, in the New York Philharmonic yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe when you were uh, initially brought into the orchestra by Zubin Mehta, you were the youngest violinist they had ever had in the orchestra. 21 you were years old. working on your master's a degree at, yeah. at Juilliard. Yeah. And you were in the or in the New York Philharmonic for how long? 13 years. That was during the late 80s and through the 90s? Uh, Until 2001, actually. So from the late 80s all the way through the 90s, it, it seems to me that it was almost a second golden period of music for the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. uh, you had people like Pavarotti, Domingo, Jesse Norman, uh, Kathleen Battle, Itzhak Perlman, uh, the list can, goes you, on. The, the list goes on and yeah. on and on. You played with all these people. You met these people. You got to know them. Uh, tell us a little bit what that was like. Did you know how special that was, you know, at your young age? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was very clear when someone was a genius like Bernstein. And, and, and the telltale sign of that, I remember we did an album of Ives symphonies, which at the time I really didn't understand. And it was not music that was close to my heart. But... Lenny was able to sell it to the entire orchestra. Um, and even though to this day I can't say it's a recording that I jump to all the time because there are other recordings, such as his Mahler recordings, which are really incredible, um, I do appreciate him opening up that world for me. And I doubt very much that anyone other than him could have sold it to the group um, to make, make us play for him that way. You know, sometimes I'm on YouTube, speaking of YouTube, yeah. uh, and I'll pull up some of those old great performances. Uh, there was one of Andre Watts, Rachmaninoff, mm -hmm. Piano Concerto Number no. 2, and right. Zubin Mehta was conducting it. It was a tremendous performance, and I uh, didn't even think about you being in the orchestra, and at some point I thought, I know that guy. That's yeah, Gary right, Robinson, right, right. Yeah. the young Gary with the dark hair. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was those days. Are, are, are there any stories that come to mind that are that are funny or entertaining that maybe only uh, you and a handful of other people would know from working with great artists. Uh, you There's know, there are one that too. comes to mind. There's one that comes to mind. It was actually the, the genesis for it was quite tragic because it was when Leonard Bernstein died in 1990 and we had a commemorative concert in Carnegie Hall, which was New York Philharmonic, but also uh, members of orchestras with which Lenny was associated. So we had people from Berlin, people from Vienna, um, and of course, soloists that they, he was very close to, one of whom was Jesse Norman, the great uh, soprano. My favorite. Um, and so she came in for the rehearsal and she had to sing Ave Maria, which is something that is an unforgettable performance in and of itself, and I own it. Um, but she walked through, and I was sitting at the time in the second violins, and my stand partner um, was actually sitting even closer to where she was going to walk by the first and the second violins. And so she walks by, and then we do the, the rehearsal, and he comes up to her after the rehearsal, and I was there within an earshot. And he was very polite, of course, she's a great diva, and, and actually very down-to-earth, a wonderful, wonderful human being. And he politely said to her, Miss Norman, if I could ask you for a favor tonight, when you come out between the first and second violins, can you just walk sideways so that in, we don't have any accidents with bumping into instruments and so on and so forth? And she turned her whole body to him, and she said, Hannah? I ain't got no sideways. <laughs> <laughs> so 
She was rather large. She was a large lady, but it, it, she had such a great sense of humor about this, and we all just broke up. And it, it was something I think all of us needed because it was such a somber occasion. Uh, the world really felt like we lost the patriarch of music, which is true. Um, and, and that was something that I think we all needed, and those of us who experienced it will never forget it. Gary, when you were living in New York for about 12 years, uh, being an audiophile, I can't think of probably a better place, especially in the 80s and 90s, we had a lot more audiophile stores, mm -hmm. but uh, none more than in New York City. Uh, was that like a Saturday for Gary? Between that and the recording stores, yes, absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, I remember the, the days of Tower Records and Stereo Exchange, which was a wonderful store downtown, um, for various reasons. First of all, they had incredible LPs before it became popular to have LPs again. Um, and second, they would have an exchange program, hence the Stereo Exchange, where they would sell you new stuff or they could say, well, one of our customers just traded in this piece of equipment. What about trying this out in this room with those speakers? We're Raven Audio. Obviously, tubes are very uh, near and dear to our heart. We All of our amps are tube-based and then mm -hmm. we make speakers and cables and a lot of other things. What is it about tubes for you personally? Uh, because I know you pretty much won't own a solid state amp. I, I, I graduated from solid state to tubes about 15 years ago. Um, and I probably should have done it 20 years ago, but um, I tend to be very careful about these things because it's a pretty expensive investment. And you know, the in the old days, the stigma was, well, your tubes are all gonna go out on you all the time. All you're gonna do is maintain them and you won't have any time to listen to music. Well, I'm happy to say in the last 15 years, I haven't lost a single tube. <laughs> no, that's probably a kiss of death, but hopefully, um, that'll continue and it's been incredibly reliable and the sound is really unlike anything I've heard in solid state So I'm very happy with my tube amp, especially with the Raven amps, which are just handmade in the United States and so well so well built Which reminds me in tonight's recording session We used a combination of vintage technology and cutting-edge technology How did you pick that technology to marry itself into a great recording experience? Well, first of all, at Raven, that is a normal thing for us to do. Our amplifiers are using very old technology, but it is uh, wrapped around very new technology. Uh, you know, people used to have their tubes go out all the time. Right. And, and now uh, modern tube amps, you don't have that problem because Incredible. the plate voltages are run lower. The tubes aren't as hot. They last a lot longer. Sure. And that's important because you get an old tube that's worth a lot of money and you can't replace that tube. You want it to last a long time. Right. Uh, but on the recording side of things, we did literally the same thing. We mixed old technology with new technology. The microphones that we used to record tonight's performance, uh, the mics that we used up close on the violin are about 80 years old. Uh, the mi then we used some mics that are farther away and they are made in the last few years and they're full frequency range modern microphones. The older microphones, the, the purpose of those is to be able to get closer to the violin and capture the tone and the clarity without picking up mechanical noise. Because as we both know, right. the violin produces a certain amount of mechanical noise and you don't want to accentuate that by having a microphone really close to it. Absolutely. So the old ribbon mics from the 1940s have the ability to record tone, but not uh, mechanical noise. James, I wonder when you have a sale how do you see the customer and what is your role after the customer becomes a customer well first of all um, we're in business to stay in business so the customer is a person that is going to bring more customers to us hmm. and they're only going to do that if they're in love with our product and we continue to treat them the way we, after the sale that we did before the sale hmm. and so what we really feel like is that when someone buys a raven product they become part of the Raven family. And regardless of whether it's Dave or Bryant or myself or some other person in the company, uh, when a person buys a, a Raven product, we say, welcome to the Raven family. That's so unusual and so special. I have to say that I have a pair of Corvus reference speakers at home. And I think about that sentiment all the time, but probably from a different standpoint of view, we listen to all kinds of music at home. And what's really amazing for me is that aha moment when somebody who has never heard those speakers hears opera or they hear just a film or they hear us in some video or they just hear something that is not the tv speakers they're they're just floored because the ravens the the, the choruses are just so incredibly versatile 
and so true in reproducing whatever it is that they're tasked to do. It could be orchestra, it could be organ, it could be a film. They're just incredible at doing that. Bob Katz, who's the number one mastering engineer in the world, has heard him. And uh, what he said when he heard him is he said, those are absolutely a mastering grade speaker. I could use those to master any album but they would also be equally at home in my living room because they're sweet and musical. And a lot of mastering grade speakers are not sweet and musical. They're not something you'd want to have in your living room. But I felt like when we did the Corvus speakers that those two uh, points of view weren't mutually exclusive and one speaker should be able to do both. And that's what we try to do with the, with the Corvus. And actually, maybe we should talk about that. Why are generally, why are mastering speakers not necessarily versatile and not for the living room? Well, I think... Uh, the focus becomes mainly on frequency response and a lot of other things suffer. Uh, you know, the sound stage on our speakers is massive. It's really wide. Mm -hmm. It's deep. Uh, the placement is accurate. Um, and the, fr the frequency response is flat. It's plus or minus one dB across uh, from about uh, 30 hertz to 27,000. Not that we can hear that high anymore or well, ever could. The most important thing is that for the listening standpoint of view, you just, the, the impression is you're getting just incredible amount of nuance, just endless amounts of nuance. So if you're listening, for example, to um, a St. Matthew's Passion, which, which has two orchestras, two choruses and soloists, no matter where they are on stage, you hear that difference. And I can tell you that that is a thrilling moment, especially if you're listening to something that maybe was recorded, uh, you know, 10,000 miles away, you would never be able to attend that concert. Well, you know, the, the goal wasn't the design of the speaker. I was behind that particular speaker, uh, all, all the speakers at Raven. Um, you know, I'm a concert goer. Mm -hmm. I, I come down to the Myerson Center and see you all the time. <laughs> and I go to New York uh, on a regular basis and, and see things there. And I played in smaller orchestras when I was younger. I am looking for it to sound in my living room exactly like it sounds when I'm sitting in Lincoln Center. Right. Or the Myerson Center or whatever. Yeah. And that's what we believe they do. Yeah, I think also the concert, in the best sense of the word, should be a marriage of great musicianship, great acoustics, and great preparation. And I think that's what you get with a great system, which is the Raven system. You know, and I think now with people being quarantined in their homes, and, and, and hopefully that won't last too long, it's very important to have a great system in your living room because there are a lot of organizations producing great content. The Met does Met a HD tremendous... Medici amazing. Uh, Medici, all of that. Yep. And there's just all kinds of sources out there and that's never going to be impressive when you're listening on earbuds. Right. That's never going to work. You have to have a great system. Uh, it could be a pair of headphones. There are a few headphones that sure. are spectacular, but it's much more exciting when you have a great system and that's going to be composed of a DAC, a great amplifier and a great set of speakers. And, and you have that hooked into Medici or live from the Met or Hulu or a movie or whatever. That content comes in and it sounds as good as your system. Absolutely. Well, you made a great point about being able to listen, let's say, to Met HD. Well, if I strap on a pair of great headphones, thousands of dollars worth of headphones, that's great for me. But I can never share that with anybody else in the room. They have to have their own headphones. That's a great point. And, and I have some great headphones uh, that are really spectacular. And we use them for recording sessions when right. we do recording sessions together. And you have the same set. Yep. Uh, and they're spectacular. But when we go and listen through a nice big set of speakers, there's an excitement that occurs that you can never get with the headphones. Exactly. It's the same excitement as you have when you're sitting among 2,500 people listening to the opera or listening to that concert or listening to a rock and roll show. So the bottom line is you want to be in your living room and be able to share it if you so wish. And that's why you need the system. Gary, thanks for being here today. This was so nice for you and Baya to come over and perform. It was really wonderful. And thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be doing more Concert in Your Living Room series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us some ideas for things that you would like to hear. We've got jazz performances planned, uh, rock and roll cover performances, more classical performances. But let us know what you'd like to hear, and we look forward to seeing you next time. The Nighthawk is our entry-level integrated tube amplifier in the ABN series. It is a beautiful space gray and is rated extremely conservatively at 20 watts per channel. This is the amplifier that has stunned reviewers and listeners alike because it outperforms other amplifiers five times more expensive. If you have any doubts, take advantage of our risk-free 45-day in-home trial and compare it in your living room 
with your speakers to our competitors' amplifiers. I promise you will pick the Nighthawk. Click on the links below and check out what the reviewers are saying about the Nighthawk Mark III.